Hello, and thank you for coming to Welcoming Week, where we are creating home together. My name is Steve Hobie. I am the museum educator at the Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana. Today, I'll be talking about traveling music through the American West, in particular how it relates to Carter County, Montana. I'll start with a quick overview of what traveling music was like in the American West. To stake a claim as a successful town in the West, the city had to establish an opera house. The ideal of the Western Opera House peaked at the end of the 19th century, in particular from the 1870s through the 1910s. To have an opera house was to be connected to the contemporary popular culture of the world. This offered a performance space for the plethora of traveling opera companies to show the city had class and sophistication while also serving other functions. For example, the Opera House in Bozeman, Montana, was also the jail and city hall for some time. These spaces could be modified for a variety of traveling performers and troops. However, ventilation tended to be poor, which left audiences feeling uncomfortable. This brought on the advent of tent shows, like circuses that swept through the area in the 1920s, which were also wholly more accessible, an issue that opera still deals with today. Vaudeville acts and Wild West shows dominated the scene following the fall of the Western Opera House. While the major paying music venues of the West provided a variety of different musical offerings, folks out West started to create their own share. Western folk music became a pastiche of country or Appalachian music, English and folk, Irish folk tunes, immigrant songs, and old church hymns. Instruments like the harmonica and guitar became prominent in American music, mainly because of their ease of travel on horseback. These cowboy songs tell the tales of ranching and frontier life, which became extremely popular to Western audiences for their relevance and Eastern audiences for its exoticism. With the advent of Western films in the 1930s and 40s, Western heritage music reached the peak of its popularity. Soon after, rock and roll would take over and change the radio waves forever. Now, how is this rich musical tradition reflected here in Carter County? Well, we have a number of musical instruments from the 1880s to 1960s that help elucidate the relationship between music and the West, as well as the homestead and immigrant history of this area. Today, I'll be touching on the history and people surrounding a pair of Hardinger fiddles, a silver peddler clarinet, a Windsor pump organ, a crown upright piano, three harmonicas, and two guitars, all housed and displayed in the Carter County Museum collections. Let's begin with the Hardinger fiddles. They are Norwegian style fiddles, originally called Hardingfele complete with a lesson book both in Norwegian and translated in English. Harding fellas first appear in the 1650s in central Norway. What's interesting about them is instead of just having four strings like a traditional fiddle or violin, there are eight or nine strings. There can be four or five strings underneath the basic four that are, are used for playing, and these strings resonate under the influence of the other four. These instruments tend to be made with a thinner wood. They have pearl inlay frets, although they do not mark finger positions. There's usually a dragon or lion of Norway carved on the scroll, or the top part, and there's black ink rosing over the body, which is a decorative art. Now, there are a variety of different tunings for the Hardinger fiddle and more than 20 of them have been recorded. One special tuning is called Fanatulin, or the Devil's Tuning, which is A, E, A, and C sharp. The Hardingfele is often associated with the devil because of this tuning, and so this music was not allowed in the church as of the 1800s, as the Hardingfele was viewed as a sinful instrument that encouraged wild dances, drinking, and fights. Some people call this tuning gray lighting, as a fiddler played this tune as a morning neared. Oddly enough, the most famous Norwegian composer, Edvard Grieg, used this tuning to round out the melody of his morning phrase in the Pier Gint Suite, number one. Let's take a listen.
ironic that something so sweet sounding was profoundly associated with the devil. And for reference, here's what our Harding fellows sound like. And sorry for my bad boasting skills, I'm a singer first. The first Harding Fela was owned by C.C. Larson, who purchased it in Norway in 1962 and played it in the Springfield Symphony Orchestra in Illinois. The other Harding Fela was owned by Ali Stenseth. He was born in South Dakota to Hans and Martha Lindbergh Stenseth. However, his parents were born in Elverum, Norway. Hans moved to the U.S. in 1901 and Martha in 1903. Hans brought this fiddle with him and gifted it to his son, Ali. They moved to Ikalaka with their family in 1910 and lived in the Persian community where they lived a farm life peacefully. Ollie ended up moving to the Flathead Valley in 1933 where he married Helen Robertson. Having originally headed out that way to farm, he and Helen began hosting the Old Time Fiddlers Contest. He and the family then moved to Missoula in 1956 while still particip participating in many fiddle contests. Unfortunately, his life was cut short in, in an auto accident in 1962. On to the next instrument. This is a silver-plated peddler clarinet. Peddler clarinets are most prized by jazz players for being the best metal clarinets. These clarinets were made by Harry Pedler. Harry Pedler was an immigrant from London where he originally learned to make woodwind instruments. He opened a business with his son from 1919 to 1930 in Elkhart, Indiana. Pedler sold high quality solid silver clarinets during this time, which are still lauded by players as the best metal clarinets in existence. Pedler sold his company to the Martin Band Instrument Company in 1930, however, he would not receive the rights to this namesake clarinets until 1937. So MBIC mass produced clarinets under the Harry Pedler and Co name until then. After they used names such as uh, the Pedler Company or Hoosier and more. This clarinet was most likely built between 1937 and 1950 based on its serial number, Hoosier name and Art Deco design on the bell. It is silver plated brass in near perfect condition. The reed of this instrument is from Crambeck's Music in Spearfish, South Dakota. It is a Rico reed, which is still a popular brand today, and is rather soft, uh, being V1.5, meaning it was probably meant for a beginning user. This clarinet was owned by Minnie Mummody, whose family originally came to Ekalak in 1914 from Nebraska. Like many other folks at this time, they came through with a large influx of other homesteaders. In 1915, she began teaching, hardly a year out of school herself. At that time, you could be given a permit to teach with the promise of attending college in the summer. She would go on to make about $60 per month and worked as such until 1921, when she headed out west uh, to the western part of the state to teach. In 1925, she marries Jess Grant, and they spend 20 years together until his untimely death upon which she returns to Ikalaka to teach for another 22 years until 1967. Somewhere in that time, we think that Minnie purchases this peddler clarinet, probably from a mail order catalog. Have you missed this giant instrument at the front end of our museum? Well, lucky for you, I get to talk about it at length. This is a Windsor pump organ, and these instruments were produced in Chicago from 1900 to about 1949. Most pianos and organs purchased during the late 19th and early 20th century were for home, home use and subsequently purchased through mail order catalogs such as Sears and Roebuck and Co. and Montgomery Ward Co. They were costing anywhere from about $500 to $1,000, which based on inflation costs quite a bit more than it would today. Often sent to rural areas, these instruments were exposed to extreme temperatures, so the manufacturer had to ensure they would hold up to these crazy temperatures. Often referred to as parlor, pump, or reed organs, these instruments were operated by pumping large foot pedals to force air through the reeds, which you can see were heartily used on the CCM organ. Stop by and check it out. Windsor brand organs like this one are 
often found in big antique stores and are pretty unique. We couldn't find another one with this kind of mirror on it as we looked at other organs. Why don't we take a listen to what this one sounds like? Notice the background pumping. That was me having my foot pedals go really quickly so that way we could pump air through the instrument. Now, this instrument was owned by the Malum family. Bernd Malum was born in Oslo, Norway in 1863, and he was adopted six months later. He ends up in Quebec with his foster parents at the age of about five. Then they decided to travel west quite slowly, hopping from farm to farm until Bernd was about 21. They decided to squat in the area that is now capital in 1884. Now that word kind of has a negative connotation today. However, at this time, it was law. If you put up fence posts and squatted for a certain amount of time, you could claim that land. Now, after establishing a solid homestead and a trail to and from Rapid City, more Norwegians were interested in this area of land. He trailblazed what then was called the Norwegian Cutoff, which is what the highway from Ekalaka to Belfouche is based on. He soon claims fame as the king of the Norwegians and establishes the capital post office and is later elected as U.S. land commissioner and also surveyor. By the end of his tenure, all of the land in Custer County, which is now Custer, Fallon, Carter, and Powder River counties, quite a big swath of land, all of that land was either privately owned and government owned due to his surveillance. His family's name was well respected and they were well off due to his activity, active community engagement. The organ came from one of the buildings in the Capitol Post Office area and was donated by his daughter, Olive Price. Have you spent any time in the schoolhouse lately? There's this really nice piano in there, and oddly enough, it looks pretty good for being 132 years old. Ours is one of the first American upright pianos to produce en masse. Upright pianos appear around 1870 with the square upright piano preceding them. This is a crown upright piano, and it was manufactured in Chicago, Illinois by G.O.P. Bent on November 3rd, 1888. A man by the name of T.J. Smith ends up picking up this piano in Chicago for his daughter, most likely having seen it in his Sears and Roebuck catalog. We don't really know much about what happens between T.J. Smith and Jack Baker, but it ends up going up for auction in Baker, and Jack and Aurora Baker purchase this instrument for $50 uh, at auction. And then we get it here at the museum. Next is are harmonicas, which are on display in the Vince Taylor toy collection. Each of them have very specific dates and interesting histories. Two of these harmonicas are manufactured in Germany and they're called Hohner harmonicas. This company first appears about the 1890s. The three harmonicas that we have are the Preciosa, 19, which is built in 1912, which is a Hohner, the old standby, which this one in particular is pre-World War II, but they end up being developed all the way until today, um, where they are currently produced in China. There's also the Warbler, which is a separate brand, and uh, this one was built in 1955. So we have quite a swath of harmonicas here. Why don't you take a listen to me uh, playing the Preciosa? These harmonicas were owned by Vince Taylor, who lived from 1928 to 1994. He's the grandson of E.T. Taylor, who owned one of these harmonicas and ended up don't giving in to his grandson as a child. Now, none of these harmonicas would have been played by Vince as a child, as the Preciosa was, ba was made in 1912, and the old Stensith well, that one was brought prior to war World War II, so that's the only one that's really got a chance to have been played by him. And the Warbler, well, the Warbler wouldn't even have been made until Vince was in the mid-20s. Now, the reason that we know this uh, for the old stent, the um, 
old standby, which is the hard one to figure out, is that it has this star in the middle of this insignia. This six-pointed star is thought to have been uh, perceived as a Star of David, which at the time of World War II, they did not want to have on in a German trademarked object. So they removed it in subsequent uh, designs. Uh, however, we don't know if this was intentional for uh, any Jewish background on M. Honer in particular. We don't know if he was Jewish or not. Um, it just is an interesting design that we don't quite understand yet, but it is useful in dating these old standbys. Now on to our guitars. We have two very interesting and storied guitars here that were handmade by very specific materials. The first guitar we have was a Stella guitar, which was built in November of 1939, owned by Banjo Jake and his stepson Charles Whitney. And it's got quite a nice uh, decal on the front of a man riding a bucking horse. We also have a handmade guitar from 1935 built by Cust Merlinen. It is all Montana wood, having ash and cedar in the body, choke cherry for the fingerboard, cattle bone making up the bridge, and sections of a Model T spring for frets, which I think is crazy to use. That's awesome that we had the opportunity to use all these local things to make an awesome instrument. Unfortunately, that instrument does not have any strings left, but the Stella guitar does. So why don't we take a listen to what that one sounds like. Now we couldn't find too much about Banjo Jake Moore, but he is the stepfather to Charlie Whitney who ended up having this guitar and which we had it donated. On the other hand, Cust or Gus Merlinen was originally born in Finland in 1880. He moved to Leeds, South Dakota at 21 to work in the mines. Now he ends up moving out to the Chalk Buttes area in 1915 to ranch. He was well known for his hard work and handiwork, having traveled to the state fair in Helena for, with many of his pieces. The guitar that we have on display is one of many pieces that Cust made. Many of his other works were gifted to other friends and can still be found in their homes. And that's all I have today. Thank you for checking in with us and learning a little bit more about the history of music in the West, in particular in Carter County. If you have any questions, please leave, please leave them in the comments and we'll answer them as soon as possible. And I wanna give a special thanks to LA Livingston and Marilyn Schultz for their help on this project. Again, I'm Steve Hobie working at the Carter County Museum. I hope you have a great day and a great rest of your welcome week.